Welcome to Episode 9 of the Ministry of Motion Pictures podcast. We're on a mission from God. The Ministry of Motion Pictures exists to advance the art of Christian filmmaking. I'm writer and director Todd Schaefer and your host. My guest in this episode is Dr. Kevin Van Hooser. This is part two of our conversation. In our previous episode, I invited Dr. Van Hooser to talk about his theological work that frames the Christian faith in theatrical terms, where our doctrines are not left to the academy, but they're intended to be put on display in the lives of God's people and the church. This framework has far-reaching implications for Christian filmmakers to tell different kinds of stories than we've been telling in the past. It moves us beyond the scope of films of Bible history, Christian biography, or social justice issues. It opens a door for Christian filmmakers to use our cinematic medium to its artistic strengths in the service of profound displays of the practice of theology in the lives of God's people. As Dr. Van Hooser said in the previous podcast, filmmakers can be allies to pastors and theologians. In this episode, Dr. Van Hooser and I talk about the practicalities of applying his dramatic metaphors to the work of Christian film. Where Dr. Van Hooser gives us a crucial theological position, my guest in our next episode is going to give us a crucial cinematic position. I can't adequately convey how excited I am to have these two guests back to back. Professor Richard Newport from the University of Georgia teaches film history and theory, and he has a particular passion for the French New Wave. He's written one of the leading books on the history of the French New Wave, and he'll be here to talk about the significance of this movement in cinematic history. Why would we be looking at the French New Wave on this podcast? The short answer is, I believe the French New Wave has many foundational lessons that Christian filmmakers need to learn if we're going to advance the art of Christian film both from a narrative point of view and a practical production point of view. These filmmakers revolutionize the cinema. And if we're going to create a Christian cinematic revolution, it's not going to come by just making more mainstream kinds of films. It's going to come together when Christian filmmakers take the drama of theology and marry it to the cinematic art form. Can you tell I'm excited? Professor Newport will be here in our next episode. But in this episode, we continue with my conversation with Dr. Kevin Van Hooser. And, you know, darkness is is the operative concept these days because in many films, particularly those for younger people, uh, the the world is dystopian, right? It's It's not a good place, it's a bad place. And I think there is a kind of eschatology, a doctrine of last things, that's circulating in our culture. It's in part fueled by concerns about the planet and ecology, but it's also, I think, a function of the fact that, you know, we don't believe there's a God out there who's looking after us anymore. That, you know, the notion of God's providence seems to have been forgotten. And so dystopian fiction means it is actually dark for people. In fact, I just heard recently that some millennials are deciding not to have children because they don't think the world will be a hospitable place for them. Yeah, I've heard that too. That's dark. Yeah, that is very dark. So what are some works of storytelling that you've read or watched that you think does this kind of thing? Oh, you know, I'm always reading books and we see films quite often, uh, but when you put me on the spot, that it's always hard to think of some. I mean, I... <laughs> I can give you, you know, the the standard answers, and these are still good answers, would be the, the fiction of C.S. Lewis and Tolkien. Yeah. Uh, it's because Tolkien really saw himself as a what he called a sub-creator. You know, he, he, he wasn't just writing stories for entertainment. He was creating a world, a meaningful world. And it's a meaningful world that speaks to ours because... We want ours to be like that. We, we desire the things, some of the things that we see, the, the kind of, the, well, the fellowship of the ring, right? We desire that fellowship. And again, this is part of what filmmakers can do. They can present Christianity not simply as, a, you know, a group of moral goody-two-shoers, uh, but, but rather 
of a way of life that is compelling and attractive and authentic? Where are the films that depict Christian communities uh, engaged in an authentic Christian community life that I think people would find very compelling? Everybody wants racial reconciliation. You know, we, we're still talking about it in yeah. North America. But in the gospel, they were on the road to racial reconciliation in the New Testament when every time Christians practice the Lord's Supper, we're, we're talking about the new humanity. We're embodying the new humanity that is in Christ. That's right. I think I've wandered from your question. No, that's but, fine. <laughs> uh, for as far as novelists go, uh, recently I've read a trilogy by Kent Haruf, H-A-R-U-F. It's a... Uh, Actions, lovely stories set in a small town in Colorado. And what's striking about it is um, the characters are ordinary. It isn't like Tolkien or Lewis where there are magical things going on. The characters are ordinary, but they're decent. Uh, mm -hmm. More than decent, they're good. And more than good, they're loving. They're ordinary people who do exceptional things in this small town. And again, that's, that's the essence of parable, right? The, the parables that Jesus told were always about ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Ah, interesting. Yeah, yeah right. and I think, I think, again, I would encourage filmmakers to think in those terms. You know, don't worry about not having a budget for special effects or CGI or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just tell good stories about ordinary people that do extraordinary right. things. That's right. I agree with that. Well, there's so much power and resonance in just the ordinary life and being able to show that in a way that is dramatic and um, engaging with an audience. I think that there's, you're right, there's a lot of potential there. Yeah, and again, back to uh, what I was saying about the drama that Christians are involved in. Involved in. You know, I wake up each day... And I think of myself as a disciple, and I want to be ready to play my part. I don't know what scene I'm going to be called to play, but I want to be ready and prepared. And I also want to think about my life as potentially heroic, you know? Yeah. Uh, I don't know what dragons I'm going to have to fight, but I want to be ready. And that gives my life a sense of meaningfulness. Hmm. That's very good. Do you have any favorite Christian films? Ah, ah, boy. Well, I I do admire the the filmmaker that is Charlie Chaplin. Um, <laughs> that's not. I, I'm not going to pretend it's a Christian film. No, it's no. not. I'm afraid, actually. He kind of, you know, when he does have a message, it dwindles into this moral therapeutic deism. But as a filmmaker, I just have uh, admiration for him, not least because he did everything himself, writing, directing, providing the music for, and starring in uh, films. And I'm thinking mainly of his feature-length films that in some sense were prophetic. Uh, his film Modern Times yeah, is a very interesting you know, send-up of our industrial age and the dehumanizing tendencies it can have. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Christian films, uh, that's, that's harder. I mean, in part because many films that I would say would be compatible with Christian, I don't know if they were made by Christians explicitly or, or not. Sure. Well, yeah, just any film. Uh, what, what kind of film? Well, okay, so I'll mention, like? I'll, mention, I'll mention <laughs> one film to you. Uh, I don't know if you've seen Babette's Feast. Oh, no, I have not. Okay, so it's a foreign film, and to be honest, my tastes often run towards independent and foreign yes. films. Certainly. But Babette's Feast, Babette is a French woman, and we don't know why, but somehow, in, according to the story, she ends up in this very tiny, remote Scandinavian village. So that's interesting already. What a culture shock. And she lives a quiet life there. But then... Uh, she wants to provide a feast for the villagers. And this is a very poor village, a lot of peasants and so on. But she goes away. We, it, apparent, the film suggests she goes back to Paris. 
and then brings back these amazing foods, spends a few days putting together this meal, and, and gives the, her friends in this village a feast. Now, I cannot help but think about the Lord's Supper when I see that. Hmm. Or, and rather, I can't help but think of the episode in the Gospels of the woman who pours out a flask of expensive perfume on Jesus' feet. It's an extravagant act. And again, ordinary person doing something extraordinary. It makes for an interesting story. And I think it has a deep resonance with what we see happening in the Gospels. Wow, that's on my watch list now. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's the Babette's <laughs> Feast. I think you just think of it as a parable of the kingdom when you watch it. Oh, that's fantastic. I will do that for sure. Um, any other films? Yeah, uh, well, another one that I, I just want to mention because it's a, a very potent filmmaking uh, example. It's called Jesus of Montreal. Never and heard of it. you haven't heard of it? No. Okay, well, this one is special. There are lots of films that actually are about Jesus, you know. Um, the, it's including the famous one with Jeffrey Hunter where his blue eyes are riveting as Jesus. Yeah. Uh, but this one, Jesus of Montreal, is special because it tells the story of Jesus in a way that I think um, accomplishes for the viewer uh, what the Gospels may have accomplished for first-time readers. Huh. Um, it tells the story of Jesus in a very interesting way. It's set in the 20th century, and you'll just have to watch it because it's, it's a little bit like a story within a story, and again, think of this idea of film as parable of the kingdom. Is it an older film or is it no, it's a, recent? I think it comes from maybe the 1980s or 90s. Oh, okay. Yeah. Huh. I'm surprised I haven't heard of it. It's uh, in French, but it, you can find it with subtitles. Sure. Huh. Very cool. So, if you were to be, be given an opportunity to speak at a Christian filmmaker's breakfast, and you were asked to charge the filmmakers with something, what would you charge them with? Uh, well, I think I would, the most important thing would be this. Try to tell stories that help make the Christian worldview more plausible um, by telling stories about ordinary people whose lives give evidence of the life of Christ in them or, or grace. Um, I, I think, yeah, just yeah. chip away at the plausibility structure, show that, you know, it's possible for uh, a man and a woman to remain married despite <laughs> the yes. fact that they argue, you know, or show faithfulness in, in action and, and forgiveness. Um, I think, yeah, and then just as the Apostle Paul says that we take every thought captive right. to the obedience of Christ. I would, I would encourage Christian filmmakers to try to take the social imaginary captive to the obedience of Christ. Because the social imaginary that prevails in our contemporary culture um, is, uh, you know, tells a different story. It's, it represents another gospel. The, the yeah. gospel, for example, that if we could only have all our desires met, we would be happy. Yeah. <laughs> That's what That's our right. culture... And, but this is a false gospel. Um, yeah. So you've got to chip away at that, the big social imaginary. Not, and that, that would be my, my biggest exhortation, I yeah. guess. Because it's out there, and it's growing, it seems. You know, I, I think it's so big and so pervasive that we don't even recognize it. And I think it, you'll know this better than me, Todd, but my guess is that... Um, Part of the reason it's hard to make Christian films is that, at least in some quarters, film is a business, right? And you have to attract people who will invest and put their money into projects. And 
uh, well, the result of doing that with the big bucks we see in studio films. I think this is why I like independent and foreign films. <laughs> and, and I guess, oh, here's my other encouragement for Christian filmmakers. Uh, think of yourselves as foreign and indie filmmakers. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I think I that agree. I think that fits the gospel much better than we're a studio project. Yes, no, I agree. Um, yes, it's it's uh, <clears throat> we are definitely indie filmmakers. We yes. we do not have the audience. We don't have the resources uh, available to us that other filmmakers do. And it's I, part of it. I think it's a shame because the church hasn't uh, marshaled around Christian filmmaking uh, in the last, you know, however long. I mean, cinema is only a hundred and twenty years old or something right, like that. Right, right. And, and where has the church been been in the midst of this? And and most of it, it seems, has been vilifying uh, the cinema. Um, and yes. But not embracing it or thinking about how it could be used for missional purposes. Or now, I think you make an excellent point in speaking of film as a medium of mission. Leslie Newbigin, when he came back from India to Great Britain, realized that in the 30 years he had been away, his beloved England had become a post-Christian society. And he realized that that presented him with a new missiological challenge, namely, how do you present the gospel to a culture that once had it and has lost it? Yeah, it's true. And boy, have we lost it. I mean, up, up here in Montreal, I think we're on the leading edge of, of having lost it. <laughs> and um, uh, kids growing up today, the younger generation, they don't even know who Abraham is, Moses, or, or even Jesus. They have no idea why they use Jesus' name in vain. Yeah, um, so there's some basic literacy we need to deal with yeah. as well. But that's, um, that may involve some direct communication, and so oh, yeah, for sure. we, need to, we need to do both. That's right. That's right. So for anybody who wants to start reading your work about this and understand it better as uh, in applying it i'm thinking specifically of christian filmmakers uh, where do you suggest they start so um there's maybe three possibilities three books one book believe it or not i wrote with some of my students from trinity oh. and it's called everyday theology oh. and what it is it's it's a book that teaches Christians how to read and understand contemporary cultural texts, including films. And so the idea that, um, that a, a film is a, a text that projects a world, uh, that would be in that particular book, Everyday Theology. Oh. And it just helps see all of culture in theological terms. I didn't know about that one. Yeah. Another one would be called Faith Speaking Understanding. Mm -hmm. I'm playing with the definition of theology as Faith Seeking Understanding. That's an ancient definition. But my, the premise is, if we really understand our faith, we will be people who are, would be able to speak out our faith and act out our faith. And so this is one of the books where I explore the theatrical model of yes. the Christian life. And then the other one, the third one that I'll mention, is called Pictures at a Theological Exhibition. Yeah, and that's that the one talks that about, me. Okay, that's the one that talks about the importance of the imagination, especially for pastors, but for really any Christian, and just the power of metaphors and stories over the way we live our daily lives, and, and how the church should not let itself be taken captive by some other gospel. I can't tell you how many hours I spent going over that first chapter in that book. It was so packed with concepts and information I was trying to digest over and over and wanted to get imprinted on my brain. And I, I even I was, would read it on two different flights uh, to, to Toronto when I was doing some shoots. Um, and both of those flights I just spent the entire time digesting and going over that chapter again and again. That chapter is worth the price of the book. <laughs> uh, although it sounds as though I may need to rewrite it. <laughs> no, it no, 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 no. It was, it, it was just, 
it was something so new and revolutionary that I'd never even thought of. I was just trying to get my head around it and then apply it to uh, my work as a as a filmmaker. So that's what I was. So I probably had a little bit more on there because I I immediately saw the application and I was trying to to pull that out of that. Well, again, I'm grateful that you are seeing some connection because theologians typically aren't the kind of people who will write things that affect the social imaginary. <laughs> I, I'm a, you well, know, I can... the good ones do. The good ones do. <laughs> well, I, I'm a, you know, I watch film, I read novels all the time. I, I, my imagination, I try to nurture my imagination. I think it's so important. But theology itself is not often written in ways that nurture the imagination. And again, that's why, to go back to my original story, my students came into class assuming they were going to be bored stiff. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. Well, I think most churches, uh, most people in churches would go to a theology class thinking the same thing. You know? Yeah, oh, when I, I, I've heard pastors, when I've heard pastors mention the word theology and then apologize for having mentioned it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I have too. Now, you wrote a book called The Drama of Doctrine. How does that fit into your panoply of, of work? So that's more of an academic book, uh, although towards the end I begin to address the church. But, you know, theologians, some of us are in the academy, and we used to belong in the church, and then we kind of got split off from the church. And that's a real shame because yeah, both sides uh, are impoverished as a result. But in that book, I actually am trying to engage some academic theologians that have a very different picture of what doctrine is. And so I was, you know, deep in a debate with my fellow theologians about the nature of doctrine in that book. But the more I explored the theatrical model, the more I just was taken by it and the more possibilities I saw. And so I... I wanted to share it with those beyond the academy, and uh, that's why I did the, the second book, Faith, Speaking, Understanding. And so that's more of a digest of what you were learning? Uh, it's more, it, it's a genuine sequel, because I don't go over all that academic ground again. It's more, it's more a claim that, look, did you know how doctrine can be so important in the life of the disciple as a form of dramatic direction, you know, that it helps us understand the story of which we're a part. That's what I explore in that, in that faith speaking understanding okay. book. Okay. Yeah. Cause I'm in the middle of that now and I'm really enjoying it. I'm yeah. Gonna, and we, we it haven't talked, we haven't talked about the various elements, but just very quickly, you know, God is the main actor and it's his word that sets all the action in motion, creation, his promise to Abraham. And the world is the stage. The Bible is the script. And we, Christians in the church, are today's actors. And so the, the, the immediate need is, we, we need direction, right? What do we say and do as followers of Jesus today? And I think if you, if you think about it, if you take the Christian life seriously, you have to admit that's a good question. Well, Dr. Van Hooser, I thank you for your time. I've taken up far too much of it as it is. Um, but uh, I, and I thank you for your work. Your work has really um, right, helped me as a me Christian filmmaker think differently about what my role is and how I need to be conceiving stories uh, and telling stories for to be an ally of the church and reach this world. Well, that's wonderful. And as I say, uh, as a theologian, we need allies in the creative arts. <clears throat> so I look forward very much to see what you come up with, Todd. <laughs> if you haven't read any of Dr. Van Hooser's books, you're in for a treat. The book that introduced me to the concept of the drama of doctrine was Pictures at a Theological Exhibition. The first chapter in that book is the one that captivated me. Dr. Van Hooser's other works that follow the same themes are Faith, Speaking, Understanding, and Everyday Theology. And if you're a Christian filmmaker, I would encourage you to get these books and read them. You'll find links to them at the ministryofmotionpictures.org. I'll also be posting links to Dr. Van Hooser's keynote address and his participation in a Q&A at a Desiring God conference on C.S. Lewis. And there's great material there. 
Looking further ahead, Mr. Richard Peluso will be my guest. He's the executive vice president of Sony Pictures Affirm Films, and he'll be here to talk about his experiences in Christian film and give us some insight into what's happening now. Thank you for joining me on the Ministry of Motion Pictures podcast. You'll find show notes and more information about us at www.ministryofmotionpictures.org. What we do in life echoes in eternity.